Okay, so what I have here is a little video. It's an animation that shows the growth of the virus in different countries in the form of a bar chart. It's an animated bar chart. So we start with China up here, which of course started the whole thing with about 80,000 cases. And after that, other countries began to become infected. And you can see on the bottom right, the date and the total number of COVID-19 cases around the world, along with the date. And then on the left are the flags of different countries. Notice how the US is pretty far down the list here initially. And um, whereas uh, South Korea and Iran were among the first uh, to show large numbers of cases. And then as time went on, you can see that things began to reshuffle. The, the virus got to Europe. Italy picked up a lot of cases. And, um, whoever is making noise in the background, would you please mute your, mute your phone? Thank you. And you can see that Italy really takes off uh, here with the cases. And uh, going off to the right here, Iran is starting to slow down. And now Spain and France and Germany are starting to pick up. So you can kind of see this migration of the virus as it went from China to other parts of Asia and then eventually to Europe. And then over time, it eventually made its way to the US. So if you, let's now focus on the US numbers down here. This point around March 18th were about 7,000 cases. And then as you can see, as time goes on, the US really starts to pick up with the caseload. And uh, you can see now it's moving up the ranks here. It's almost like a little horse race. Not one you wanna be in, but this is, the, this is what happened. And so now things really start to pick up in the US. You can see things are just beginning to accelerate. And in a second, you'll see a really sudden burst of acceleration as the virus follows that curve of infection, exponential infection growth. And there it goes now, it's overtaking Italy, overtaking China, and now we're way ahead in terms of cases compared to the rest of the world. And so you can really appreciate how, you know, we came from nothing just in a couple of months and become the sort of the most infected in terms of numbers uh, country in the world. And it's still going on, unfortunately. So that's a little short history of uh, how the virus spread and how the U.S. is doing by comparison with the rest of the other countries. And now we're well ahead of the rest of the world in terms of number of cases. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of the, specifically within the U.S. And um, so what I have here is the growth of cases in the U.S. as a graph. It's a, um, it's a graph that shows uh, the number of cases. Uh, and you can see as a function of date here at the bottom. So we're starting from about February 15th until roughly today. This is a few days out of date, but it's still uh, pretty relevant. And so I'd like to characterize uh, how we respond to this virus initially and throughout this uh, infectious period uh, by quoting a president. Uh, after all, he is the, uh, the chief uh, the leader in charge. And so back in January 22nd, we had our first case, and uh, the quote is, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China. We have it under control. It's going to be just fine. So at that point, with our very first case, and we did not take it very seriously. As we get closer to uh, February 15th, uh, when we have a, a total of 12 cases in the U.S., he said, looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it'll miraculously go away. That was prediction back in February. And on February 25th, the coronavirus is very much under control in the USA. Stock, stock market is starting to look very good to me. At this point, we had 35 cases and the market just bottom fell out of the market shortly thereafter. It's going to disappear. One day it's a miracle, it will disappear. At that point, we had 60 cases. And we have, once we started having deaths in 153 cases, the following quote, some people will have this at a very hot, light level and won't even go to a doctor or hospital and they'll get better. There are many people like that. Not quite sure what that means, but still it's not being taken very seriously. Further den denial around March 8th, when we have 500, more than 500 cases and more than 20 deaths. The fake news media and their partner, the Democrat party is doing everything with its semi-considerable power, dot, 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 to inflame the coronavirus situation. So now it's becoming political. 
and shortly thereafter, March 10th or so, we're prepared and we're doing a great job with it and it will go away. Just stay calm, it'll go away. So at that point, we had 600 cases and about 22 deaths. And you know the rest of the story at this point. So middle of March, we're using the full power of the federal government to defeat the virus and that's what we've been doing. So starting to be, trying to be reassuring, but at the same time trying to claim that we've been doing something all along, which we haven't been doing. Acknowledging it's a very contagious virus, but still claiming that we have tremendous control over it. That's after 2,700 cases and about 54 deaths. I felt that was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. That's a little bit of reverse engineering of history there. I always treated the Chinese virus very seriously and have done a very good job from the beginning. So this is uh, after 6,400 cases and over 100 deaths. America will again and soon be open for business, very soon, a lot sooner than three to four months someone was suggesting. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem. Of course, the problem back then was quite a bit less than it is today. I'd love to have the country opened up and just raring to go by Easter. So Easter's coming up this weekend. I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't believe you need 40,000 or 30,000 ventilators. You know, you go into major hospitals, sometimes they'll have two ventilators. And now all of a sudden they're saying, can we order 30,000 ventilators? So again, not really facing up to the reality of what's going on. The country would be doing well if it could hold the number of deaths down to 100,000. So now we're of course setting a much bigger target. And if we fall short, we'll consider that success and victory, but still ignoring the fact that thousands of people are dying. The, pro the professionals, this was an attempt at a joke with the president. The professionals did the models and I was never involved in a model, at least not that kind of model. The rest of the quote is missing here. So here we are today, over 457,000 cases and over 16,000 people dead. And as you can appreciate from this curve and from the quotes I, I read to you, we were roughly three months uh, short of acting when we should have. So in other words, if we had acted three months sooner, we could have avoided most of what we're experiencing today. Which isn't to say that some action is better than no action. And in, in fact, everything we're doing now with social distancing and so on is really paying dividends as we'll see. So when I talk about scientific models as, as I did in the, in the title, it's really based on one fundamental concept and that is something called the R factor. And the R factor is something that's unique to each type of virus. And it determines how infectious it is, how quickly it spreads from person to person. And we refer to this, uh, the initial value of this R factor as R zero. R zero means the zero here refers to what happens, how the virus spreads if we, if we do nothing, absolutely nothing to, to prevent it spreading. And uh, in the case of the coronavirus, we've had a range of estimates as to what the R naught is. And I think the scientists are settling around a value of two, 2.2 or so. And to give you a sense of what that means, I'll, sh I'll show you two bracketing examples. If the R zero is 1.5, that means one person will affect one and a half other people on average. So four people would therefore infect six people. And six people, if you multiply 1.5, will affect nine people. So you can see you go from four to six to nine, and yet there's geometrical increase in the infections, and that leads to an exponential growth. However, if you have a higher R zero, or R not, let's say three and a half, which was in the high end of the estimates early on, that means that four people can infect 14 people now. We call that each generation of infection. And so 14 people now can infect 49 people. You take 14 multiplied by 3.5, now you get 49. You see it's a much more rapid increase in the infection rate. It's all determined by this R value, this R naught value. So the goal here is really to take that R naught value and bend it to a smaller value. So what you want, you want, you want to get a smaller value so that some value of R that is less than R zero. And that will slow down this, this un, un, unrestricted growth of the virus. So for example, if it was 1.5, like in the previous example, the virus will still spread, but it's gonna do so more slowly. And what that actually does, it does two things for you. It buys you time. And, and if you reduce it enough, it keeps, it, it keeps the, the, the load, the caseload of people going to hospitals underneath the system capacity line. I'll, I'll show you that in the graph here. So the red curve here, and it shows you what would happen if you let the 
infection rate increase without bound, without intervention, at that value of R, R0 of 2.2. And what happens is it quickly exceeds the capacity of hospitals to, to accept new patients. Right? The number of ventilators, the number of ICUs and ERs and so on. And so this dotted line shown across here is hospital capacity. At any given time, this is how many patients a hospital system in our country can handle. And so without intervention, the virus will increase in numbers, infection rate will increase, quickly exceed the, the, the healthcare system capacity. And this is a disaster then because people are now dying not only because uh, of the virus, but also because they're not being able to be treated. And so we don't want that. And so all the effort, all the talk you've heard about bending the curve, flattening the curve, it's really to make it go from this red scenario to the blue scenario. Where now you, you've flattened it a little bit, you've made the R a little bit less, so the increase in time is shallower. You're still gonna get a lot of infections, um, but the point is, you, if you keep it under the healthcare system capacity line, you'll be able to treat everybody and not have people dying in the hallways and things like that. And that's what the, really what we've been trying to do, and I think we've been reasonably successful at it, although in a few instances locally in certain areas of the country, we have exceeded that system capacity. So really, it's, it, these models are really all about what can we model, what, how, can we, how can we predict things so that we can help hospitals prepare, help our country prepare to deal with the crisis. That's really what these models are useful for. And of course, like any scientific model, it's only as good as the data comes into it. So as we do more social distances, distancing, we update the models, and that gives us more refined predictions and so on. And so that brings us uh, to the other critical aspect of how we can accurately model the spread of these viruses, uh, and that is by testing. Without testing, it's really hard to know what problem it is that you're dealing with. You don't know how wide, widespread the infections are. You don't know where it's happening in the country. And so the reason we, we really had a problem with not enough testing is because we did, we're not able to you know, come to grips of what we're dealing with. We're not able to define what we're dealing with. And so, for example, we now know that people who get the coronavirus can either be asymptomatic, no symptoms at all, have mild flu-like symptoms, or have super severe symptoms that require hospitalization and may even lead to death from complications. And so we really would like to be able to triage people and determine, well, which of these categories do they fall in? Again, the more testing you do, the better you're able to do that. And then the other reason you want to do testing is it allows you to identify hotspots throughout the country. So here's the current hotspot situation in the US. And, uh, and all these dot, the, the reddish dots are the most intense hotspots and the yellowish dots are less intense. And really, it's, the reason you want to know that is because you, if you know where the hotspots are, then you can funnel all your resources to those hotspots and not spread them around where they're not needed, not having enough where they are needed. It also allows you to test for people who already had the virus and who built up immunity to it. And, and once you have immunity to it, you can go back to the workforce or you can help out in hospitals as a volunteer. That's another reason you want to test people to make sure they're over the virus but have the immunity. Also, if they're currently showing symptoms, if they have the virus at the moment, you can then inform them to stay at home and not infect others because they may not know if you don't test them. And then uh, it gives you insight into how transmittable the disease is. And then finally, it just helps improve scientific modeling. So the more testing we do, the better able we're, we're to predict uh, what's gonna happen and better in, inform how resources are used to fight the virus. So, a couple of ways we can manage the virus. One is, of course, socially, like we have been doing, and the other is medically. Unfortunately, at this point, you can't do much medically simply because the, um, without a vaccine, you can't really prevent it. And so, and you can't make it, there's no cure for it. And so all you can really do at the moment is use drugs to administer therapy. So if you have complications, for example, in the hospital, we can treat those complications with drugs that are currently available, varying degrees of success, depending on what the complication is. But it doesn't cure it, it just simply uh, gives you a fighting chance to overcome the virus by, by treating the, the complications that might have been induced by the virus. Uh, we are still probably about 12 to 18 months away from a vaccine. So until that happens, we're not gonna be able to eradicate the virus completely. And then the third thing is if we don't do anything, we can rely on a natural process called herd immunity. And I'm sure a lot of you heard about herd immunity. And the UK actually tried to do this for a short period of time and unfortunately, as, as many people would have predicted, it didn't work. And I mean, it would have worked eventually, but at a high cost. And so the idea here is that you let the virus run wild, 
until enough people are infected that there's fewer people to infect and, 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 and those who have been infected have built an immunity to it. And so <coughs> given enough time, fewer people have the ability to infect other people because they're already immune. And then, and then um, there's fewer people to infect left. And uh, this actually works really well. Unfortunately, it kills a lot of people, particularly in the case of the coronavirus, which is very high mortality rate, it's around 2%. I compare that to the flu, which is about 0.1%. And so we don't want to use herd immunity. That would, that would kill millions of Americans if we did that. So that was never really an option. And uh, the fact that they even tried it in the UK, may, ironically, may explain why Boris Johnson ended up in the hospital. So social intervention is really the best option we have. And so now the question is, ultimately boils down to resources and the economy versus human life. Because human cost is really twofold. There's, there's the health cost and then there's the economic cost. People are being laid off, they're not able to work, uh, and that puts hardship on families and so on. That's one type of human cost. The other is, 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 is really death and how many people are willing, you know, willing to sacrifice in order for, for the economy to be uh, productive. And so the best strategy, of course, especially in hindsight, is that early on intervening with social uh, uh, social se separation, social distancing is really the most effective way if you do it right away. Unfortunately, we had a three month late, delayed start on that, but late is better than, than never. And so we're finally coming to grips with that. And then ultimate question of course, is what is a life worth? Should we sacrifice the entire economy for one person or is there some kind of balance that we can achieve? Um, and, and, and believe it or not, there are some politicians who came, politicians who came out of the woodwork and said, well, you know, the elderly have had a good, maybe they should sacrifice themselves for the economy. And this is something that uh, Dan Patrick, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas actually said bar back on March 24th. And that's certainly not something I would advocate. I don't think it really follows our Unitarian principles. In fact, I would argue that the best way to, to really wrestle with this was really a, somewhat of a philosophical question as well, is to use our UU principles to guide our thinking. So we have to look at the three most relevant UU principles here the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And that applies both economically and, and health-wise. We shouldn't just be dismissing people's lives, um, like the elderly, for example. And, but we, are, we should also consider the, the inherent worth and dignity of people who had a job uh, or, or who might be sick. Justice, equity, and compassion. Of compassion being the most important thing here in human relations. We have to be compassionate about people who have been sick, people who have been laid off. And also compassion in how we deal with each other so we can overcome the social distancing business and, and learn to get along. And of course, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are part. And no better example of that is during, during time of a crisis like this, because this virus really attacks the entire web, as you can see, uh, based on that earlier animated graph I showed you. It doesn't care where you live, it will spread throughout the world and affect everybody. And the web that we are all part of also helps propagate the virus. So we, you know, so we have to use that web of interconnectedness to actually come up with solutions to fight the virus in turn. And I think as we follow our UU principles, I think that's something that we can achieve. We can achieve a balance between, you know, economic costs and human costs. Because at the you know at the end of the day, the economy can recover, but dead people cannot, and that's really the bottom line. So in conclusion, I just want a, a couple more comments. I do think the curve is being flattened. I'll show you some data that might support that. It's not absolutely foolproof yet, but I think we're on the beginning to see the first glimmers of it. Um, the arc of the curve is bending towards hope. I really think uh, we're, we're starting to turn a corner here and look, look at some data. And I'm gonna point you to a website here called worldometers.info. And it's, not, it's a nice website from the perspective it collates data from all kinds of agencies around the world and if you really want to stay up to date on the, on the numbers and to see what's going on and inform yourself, I would, I would recommend uh, using this, um, this link to, um, to check it out. So let's click on that. And so when you click on the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see the, uh, the world numbers. So right now there's about 1.6 million cases in the world actively or people who have, who have actually gotten the virus since it first broke out, approaching 100,000 deaths worldwide and about 355,000 people have fully recovered from it. You can now look at some graphs. So here's an example of the total number of cases in the world 
as a function of time. And um, you can see it's more or less like an exponential type curve uh, with all the, all the action occurring more, most recently. And one of the tricks we like to use in science and math is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with logarithmic scales, is it's, it's very difficult to show. Am I seeing it? I'm told that you cannot see the web page, so let's try the following. Okay, so it looks like we can see this web page now. This is the page I was linking to. And so um, right now there's about 1.6 million cases worldwide, almost 100,000 deaths. And here's a graphical representation down here. And uh, it's very difficult sometimes on a single graph to show really large numbers like 1.6 million and really small numbers like 20. And uh, so you don't get a good sense for what's going on. And so we, instead we like to sometimes use logarithmic scales where now the, the, the time axis is still the same, but the vertical axis is now in powers of 10. We start with 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 million and so on. So it's, a more, it's an easier way to display the, the, the extent of the data. And what you can see here is this initial uptick in cases early on. Well, this is, the, this is China. So China leveled things off at around 100,000 cases uh, early on by essentially shutting down the entire province of Wuhan. And then the city of Wuhan. And then um, things flattened off. And then the rest of the world started getting infected. And then you had a second ramp up, a second wave of infections leading up to here. And you can see as you follow this curve, there's a hint that it's starting to bend. It's starting to flatten out a little bit. Now, this is, it's still growing exponentially, but at a slower rate. In other words, we're reducing that value of R, and that's always a good sign. And if we look at the death rate, uh, we see uh, not quite that effect yet because death rate lags behind the case rate because uh, it takes two to three weeks for someone with, with symptoms of coronavirus to eventually die. And so there's like a two or three time lag. So the death rate is not yet experiencing the flattening of the curve but in the world, but the cases are. If you scroll down on this website, you can see all the countries in the world listed. So you can click on any country if, that you're interested in to see what's going on. And then the U.S. is shown right here. And you can see that today, we had 30,000 new cases and 1,700 new deaths. And if we click on the USA link, we can now see the, the synopsis of the values for the US, over 460,000 cases, 16,500 deaths. And um, now you can break it down by state. So if you, if you look at New York, New York, for example, when New York City has been really hammered hard, the death rate is still very high. Each day they're breaking new ground in terms of number of deaths. But the number of cases is declining. So in other words, the increase in number of new cases is declining. So not so long ago, it was 15 to 20,000. Now it's more like 10. So that's, that's a good sign. That means that the, the, the cases are flattening, even though the death rate is not. And like I said before, the death rate lags the, the uh, infection rate by about two to three weeks. And so we expect the same thing to start happening to death rate in a week or two. And then if you have Michigan, for example, we're still considered a hotspot. We're third in the country in terms of the number of cases, 21,000 altogether, number of deaths, 1,076, 117 just today. And so um, for reasons that are not completely understood, Michigan is even way ahead of California, even though California has a much higher population. And you can see some other hotspots popping up. Louisiana is coming up as a hotspot, Florida, um, and so on down the list. But like I said, what this data is showing is a slowdown in the increase of cases, and uh, which we, I th we think will translate into slowing down in the death rate and eventually reversal in a few weeks. So I do think in the coming months, uh, all these things are going to start declining and we'll be over the, over the peak of the curve. And from that point on, we just have to be careful how we begin this process of lifting uh, social distancing. If we do it too fast, we'll get a second wave and like what might be happening in Singapore right now. And if we do it too slowly, we damage the economy. It's gonna be a pretty tight balancing act in terms of what we do. Um, but I'm hopeful. I think the data is suggesting in an objective manner that things are getting better 
And as long as we're careful with how we do social distancing in the next few months, I think, uh, I think it will become manageable. So at this point, I think I'd like to, um, any questions? So let me go ahead and unmute everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if you guys have sent me any questions. Yeah. Uh, Ned, can you hear, can you hear me, Ned? I sure can. I got a question. Right. Have we come up with a situation where the some hospitals have to decide about who lives and who dies because of the lack of uh, ventilators. Yes, I, I've heard anecdotal, anecdotal stories about that. I don't know how true they are, um, that people are dying in hallways. But that's, um, I think what I, what I can say is I know in the Beaumont system, they've offloaded some of their cases to Crittenton and other nearby hospitals. They can spread the load around so there's always enough ventilators. I've not heard of any cases around here where we just literally have run out of ventilators down to the last one. But I'm not an MD, so I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. another, another question. Um, is it possible that there could be tens of millions that die with this epidemic like it was in, in 1918? <laughs> Did you repeat that question again? Is it possible that there could be tens of millions that die from this epidemic like they did in 1918? If we had done nothing, if we had not done, if we had not done any social distancing, the answer is yes. It could have easily led to that many deaths, but I don't think that will happen this time around because of the social distancing and, and other things that we've done. I think just wearing masks, for example, in Asia, it's culturally acceptable to wear masks. And I think if we came out of this and, and wore masks, that might actually help us to lift the social distancing quicker as well. So I think as many of things we can do, we just have to be willing to do them. And um, I think that, I don't think we'll get into those kinds of millions of numbers. But honestly, if we had not done nothing, nothing, it could have easily been those numbers. Thank you. Hey, Nev, this yes. is Nev Court. Um, I have a couple of questions on the modeling. Um, you mentioned what the model, uh, the, what comes out of the model is as good as the Could everybody please mute that's not talking? Thank you. So what I wanted to say is um, with any model, the data that uh, output that comes out is as good as the data. So the data that's feeding into these models, I know that Lisa and I have talked like, you know, right now you see things like in China, there are Wuhan, you know, there's only like really small number of new cases to buy, you know, how can that be right? Across the, I guess, the government numbers that are, that are feeding in there because it seems to me like, even under the best of circumstances, how could they have gotten their new infection rate down so low or is it being suppressed to make it look politically advantageous to their government? I don't know. And I don't know that any of us saw that answer, but that, that's one question that I have. Let me answer that one first. Um, yeah, I, I think that part of, the, part of not being able to find the problem is not doing enough testing. So you don't really know what you're dealing with. So all we can do is guess. Um, to, well, educated guesses, right? Because some sampling is better than none. And so I think in the case of China, let's tackle that one first. Uh, a lot of people don't trust their numbers. Um, and it's not, but it could also be inadvertent in the sense that not a lot of people were tested initially. And also a lot of people die, and this is actually true in the U.S. too, could be dying because of virus-induced um, problems with complications from underlying conditions, but they die in their homes, and when they get taken to the hospital, no one bothers testing them, because, you know, everybody's swamped trying to do what they're doing in the ICUs, and so a lot of potential COVID deaths may be, un may be underreported simply because no one tested them either before or after they died. And uh, so, for example, in New York, even, uh, they talk about going to people's homes and people dying with cardiac arrest and things like that, in numbers much larger than normal. And so that would suggest that maybe they had the virus, triggered underlying condition, because there is some connection with cardiac issues. 
and that could have triggered a heart attack. Again, these are, these are anecdotal stories, but I get your point. And that, and that is without testing, we're probably underreporting not only the number of deaths, but also the number of cases. Okay. And then I guess my second question is when if eventually the social distancing relaxes a little or they give us the all clear, and I know it's not gonna be a big thing from what we're doing now completely back to what normal was, but as they reintroduce it and they say, okay, it's time to go back to work or whatever, whatever the case may be, I'm just trying to visualize what will be a safe way to do that? What sorts of behaviors will we be able to do and not do? And, you know, I mean, right now we're really keeping distance from everybody and I'm visualizing going to my office downtown, getting into the elevators with all of those people. And I just, I can't see how we go from the safe kind of bubble that we're in to safely reintegrating back into normal life again in a way that's controlled and the right way to do it. Yeah, I think it's probably gonna have to be done in stages. And I think, um, Governor Cuomo said it best when he said, we're not gonna get back to normal, it'll be a new normal that we've got to live with. And um, I think um, part of the testing is, one of the things that they're looking at is to test for um, antibodies that would suggest that you actually had the virus at one time. And, uh, and so once we can figure out how to test people for that, then they're safe to go back to the workforce. And an immediate need would be obviously in the healthcare industry to get them back in there to helping out. Um, Secondly, I think wearing masks, making it mandatory for everybody in the country to wear them, I think would be tremendously helpful because uh, I think we can build enough masks to do that. And we, plus we can make our own. And, and some mask is better than no mask. That's what they're saying now. And I think that's also gonna be helpful. But ultimately it will not, never go to normal until we get the vaccine and vaccinate everybody. And once we eradicate the virus, then we can go back to what we used to call normal. But in the meantime, it's gonna be, I think, a slow adjustment period. I don't think we have to be at this level of social distancing over the next 12 months, I don't think that's great. <laughs> but like I said, it's gonna be a fine balance trying to figure out when, how to, how to start lifting it gradually. And maybe wearing masks is one, one of the options available to us. Okay, thanks. Sure. Neb, do we really think people are going to ease back into that, lifting these restrictions. I know today they were talking that, um, you know, with Governor Whitmer extending our stay home until April 30th, that there was a lot of discussion in the legislature that they think that's a little too strict. Um, you know, how do we think people are really gonna weigh the economics versus personal safety and health? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very much dependent on what people do for a living, too. I mean, I, you know, I think one of the issues was people who do landscaping, landscaping businesses and contract construction workers and people like that, contractors. I mean, they're, they're getting hit really hard because they're not able to work and they, they feel like they're not really in a position to infect a lot of people. But I, I think the governor made a good point when she said, you know, we're all in this together. If we start, I mean, it goes back to this interconnected web. If, if we start making exceptions, that means we're tearing the web in certain places. And that's just not gonna work if we're trying to defeat the same enemy. And so I, I think that the problem is, even though a person might think they're independent, like a contractor, they're still gonna have to go to Home Depot and buy supplies and interact with people there, put them at risk, or maybe pick something up from the people working at the cash, and then going back and working um, on, the, on uh, in landscaping. So it's, it's never that simple. And that's why it's, it's really important, I think, to be strict initially and to not make exceptions and make sure we have it under control and then start slowly easing into these exceptions. And I think that's what she's, she's trying to do. And I, I believe she said it was the, until the end of April, right? I think is it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we can reevaluate between now and then. Yeah. So Neb, um, everything I've been seeing is saying that um, African-Americans are, they get sick more often they die more often. I wonder if you have any sense for whether that's, I assume it's true, it's in the numbers, why that might be. It's, it's very much true. And uh, like, we, like when we talk about climate change and how it disproportionately affects disadvantaged populations, same thing is true here. It's true every time, no matter what the crisis is. And, uh, and it has to do with, uh, ultimately with socioeconomics and the fact that uh, unfortunately, 
in the African American community, there's a, there's a lot of diabetes and other complicating underlying conditions, and 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 that makes them particularly vulnerable to the virus because, it, in a sense, the virus triggers those things. And so, it's hard enough to fight the virus, but when you have those all those conditions at the same time, you, you often cannot. And I think that's probably one of the major reasons why it's not just true in Detroit; it's, it's other African American communities throughout the country. And sometimes urban density plays a factor too, like in New York City, for example, where people are living close to each other and um, people going to, ch to church in large numbers, all those things add up to greater infection rates and poor outcomes. Neb, you used the phrase on one of your graphs, slow, careful lifting of social distancing. Can you propose or suggest what that timeline might look like and what might happen, say, at the end of April, May, June, July, August, September, when kids go back to school in September. Give us a little broader picture of what the limitations might be and what might come off at any given point in time. I wish I could do that for you, but I believe this is not my area of specialty and uh, I cannot make that prediction uh, nor offer an opinion on it. But what I can tell you is there are certain things we wanna consider for sure. Um, I think once we start going back to work, we may still wanna practice social distancing, the two meter rule, six foot rule. We may wanna be wearing masks, uh, all those things. And maybe letting healthcare, healthcare workers go back first and then slowly easing in those people who are mostly um, not interacting with, with as many people in, 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 by the nature of their job, things like that. Um, but no, I, I'm not going to venture in terms of a timeline or anything like that. I do know that uh, uh, at the end of April, and I think the Trump administration is already signaling this, is they really want the economy opened up again in May. And so what I hope they won't do is open it up too suddenly, uh, like they wanted to do you know, at the beginning of April, because I think that will definitely create a second wave. I mean, just like other countries where they've done this and it's inevitable. And, um, and so, and we, in which case you're gonna be stuck with an even longer period of economic downturn. So I, I think there's gonna to have to be some intelligent political debate on this issue. And I think, I do think that both the president and, and the two parties have finally realized how severe this is. And I do think, and I'm hoping that they'll work together to form, to form this right balance I don't know if they'll follow you, your principles, but I hope at least they follow something like that to help them strike a balance between uh, health and economic situations. Thank you. Yeah. I noticed there was one question here from Karen about how does the U.S. compare with other countries based on census? Not quite sure what that what you meant by that question. Well, obviously. Uh, the um, statistics as opposed to related percentage-wise of population. So Great Britain was quite low on the list, but is their pop, you know, I don't know offhand what their population is compared to even Belgium or, you know, another country similar. Yeah, another way to look at that is the per capita infection rate okay. mm -hmm. and the per capita death rate. And uh, we're actually doing pretty well on that compared to other countries. Well, compared to Italy and Spain and so on. But a lot of that go back, goes back to the testing question earlier. A lot of that could be just because of inadequate testing. Mm -hmm. And not, not so much inadequate testing, but uh, inadequate testing of cause of death. And I think so until we, we stabilize that parameter, it's not going to be clear. But so far, we seem to be doing pretty well on a per capita basis. Okay. And I think some of that could have, have to do with the fact that we're spread out country and whereas Italy and Spain tend to be fairly condensed, with large urban centers, so who knows? But that's, that's, that seems to be coming out of this. Cheryl, you had a question, uh, but I think it was answered by an answer I gave to another question about how can we be sure of the numbers without testing? Did you have a follow up on that, Cheryl? Cheryl? Okay, guess not. So may I ask another question okay, then related that. to the overall timeline? I've heard several individuals posit that 
they do see the curve going down, flattening out during the summer. And then they see it beginning to come back in the fall or the early winter. I don't fully understand the ramifications of climate and the virus. Or is it just that there's a lack of social distancing? What would you attribute that perspective to and do you support it? Um, I'm not enough of an expert to support or not support it, but what I would say is there are many parameters that go into these scientific models. And one of them is temperature. It's not the overriding parameter, but it is one of the parameters. And so the idea is that in, in, hotter, in hotter climates and hotter air, the virus doesn't prop, propagate as well. Uh, it doesn't travel, travel as far through an aerosolization process. And so, and that the, the optimal temperature seems to be right around the temperature we're having here in April right now. And so if it's colder or hotter than that, it doesn't do as well. But it's just one of many parameters. Uh, but yes, everything else being equal, that would predict a, a slight resurgence in the fall. I don't know what they base it, what other parameters they base this prediction on, but um, temperature is, is a small but significant contributing factor, yes. Thank you. I know that uh, the vaccine is not going to be here right away, but eventually uh, it will be. And how good are how good are we at producing safe and effective vaccines? Or said another way, what's your assessment of how likely it'll be that when they say a vaccine shows up, we're going to it's going to work and it's not going to do more harm than good? Yeah. So generally, the, the the process that vaccines go through is same as any other drug. You go through a, a through a series of safety tests. So you have a, a safety test to make sure it doesn't have toxic effects before you administer it to the general population. And so there's two types of tests. One is safety test, the phase one trial, and then there's the efficacy test. And that is, does it actually help the person now that we know that it's safe? Because it can be safe and not effective, or it can be not safe and not effective. But either way, it, it doesn't help you. And so it has to be first shown to be safe and then effective, and then administered to the general population. And um, that probably won't happen for at least 12 more months. I do know that some trials are starting right now. Uh, and, uh, and there's many, many, many companies in many countries uh, trying to develop a vaccine. And I think given the, the large effort, multiple countries, we may actually shorten that time on a little bit. And the odds of making, having an effective vaccine will obviously increase as a result. So, but every, everybody I've read suggests uh, at least 12 months from now. But we have something that we use an entire population. Uh, Ned, this is Larry Larson. Uh, don't we need a, a worldwide strategy, maybe led by the United Nations, to deal with uh, this, uh, this epidemic? That would be nice, but it, it runs counter to the philosophy of this administration. In fact, uh, Trump has already announced that he's going to defund uh, WHO. And so, so we cannot contribute to it. And so I think that would suggest that sends a pretty strong signal that the U.S. doesn't want to be dictated to by any global organizations. And that's consistent with, with the governing philosophy. So I don't think that's going to happen. I wish it weren't true, but. Maybe after November. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone.